Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Innovation Forum webinar, or discussion, as we'd rather term it, about circularity in fashion. In the usual way, we're going to wait a couple of minutes for everybody to filter in and join us. We had more than 800 registrations for this, uh, so we're expecting at least a couple of hundred of you to show up on the day. Uh, the numbers are climbing, so we'll just wait a second before we start for everybody to come in and join us in the room. You will be able to ask questions, uh, use the Q&A function um, on the Zoom, and then you can vote for each other's questions to see who has the best question. And those are questions that I will put to our panel. So please get questioning and please do uh, vote for your favorite questions. And we'll, uh, we'll put those to the panel in the second half of our hour. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Toby Webb, uh, founder of Innovation Forum. Um, we are uh, a grandiosely titled platform for change. Uh, we're still trying to work out what that means, but effectively it means being a, a purpose-driven organisation. Um, we're a company of about 12 people um, based out of London, and our mission is really to try and enable discussion of practical solutions and chart the change in various industries around sustainability as we move towards our, our goal of net zero and regenerative business models uh, over the coming years. We've been doing this for about eight or nine years now. And prior to that, those of us who, who set up Innovation Forum ran another business, um, which originally I started in 2001. So it's been a long journey uh, to get to where we've got to. And over the years, we have run, um, since 2013 or 14, a Sustainable Apparel and Textiles Conference. And that conference has become increasingly sophisticated um, through our speakers because the solutions and the scale at which those solutions are being deployed around sustainability in apparel and textiles is really taking off now. And, and this year's conference was a great example of that. So if you don't know our work, you don't know our events, our research, um, our stakeholder engagement and, and other products, you can find out about all the stuff we're doing in, in this space just by looking on the website or looking on your Spotify app or your podcast app, because quite a lot of what we do is put out there for free. Um, not all of it, the face-to-face -face conferences uh, remain under the Chatham House rule, uh, and so do some of our online events. But we do lots of webinars like this, uh, and lots of podcasts, and so there's an awful lot of information already out there, not just from us, but from many others, on circularity and fashion. So we hope you can find the website and the podcast channel useful uh, if you don't already get our emails. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to ask our panel to introduce themselves, um, and then we're going to get into some of our talking points, and then we'll hand over to, to questions uh, and answering questions in the second half of the hour. So uh, why don't we start on my top left, as I see it on my Zoom. Megan, why don't you give us a, a quick 30 seconds on who you are and uh, about textile exchange for those who don't know. Megan. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. So I am Megan Stonebrenner, the Director of Fibers and Materials at Textile Exchange. For those of you that are new to Textile Exchange, we are a global nonprofit organization really focused on driving positive or beneficial impact across tier four. So really focusing on raw material production, sourcing, and the growing of our materials as well. Thanks, Megan. Sarah, why don't you go next? Yes, great. Thank you. Um, I mean, likewise, thanks for the invite. Delighted to be here with everyone today. Um, uh, my name is Sarah Hayes, and I'm working as a business expert for circularity with the H&M Group. And uh, I mean, at the H&M Group, we are on a journey uh, to transition towards a circular ecosystem where we are designing products that are uh, already from the drawing board designed to circulate uh, through the multiple loops of an ecosystem, fueled by a reverse supply chain and in turn giving access to a more circular customer journey. Um, yes, so happy to be with you today. Thank you, Sarah. David. Um, thanks for having me as well. Nice to see you and fellow panelists and welcome audience. Um, my name is David Kors. I head up sustainability for VF Corporation. Um, VF Corporation is home to a family of brands that are rooted in the outdoor space, as well as active wear um, and lifestyle. So examples include um, the North Face, um, Dickies, Vans, um, Timberland, Icebreaker, and more recently an acquisition of um, Supreme. 
So within VF, um, next setting of um, sustainability for the EMEA region, um, I also have the privilege to spearhead circularity for VF cooperation globally, which really is a very collaborative effort. I'm working with countless functions across the globe um, to understand what circularity means for VF and how it will progress into that direction over the next couple of years. Great, thank you, David. Look forward to hearing um, more about that later. Lucy, welcome. Uh, tell our viewers and listeners who you are and about APR. Thanks, Toby. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. I'm just able to make the connection work on my phone right now. Uh, my name is Lucita Jasmine. I'm the Sustainability Director of the April Group. Um, we are based here in Indonesia with our operations, but our head office is in Singapore. We are a producer of fiber that goes into viscose production and part of the RGE group. So together with sister companies, Saturday and Asia Pacific Rail, we are the biggest producer of viscose right now in the world. So thanks and nice to meet you, Megan, Sarah and David as well. Thank you, Lucy. And we'll be talking a bit later how viscose can be and increasingly is a a circular fibre, uh, an important one to add to the mix. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we said in the, in the marketing spiel about this that we'd have an honest conversation about the factors driving brand choices and the circular solutions that exist. We do like to have some bold copy in our Innovation Forum webinars and challenge our speakers. So really looking forward to, to them talking through some of the, uh, the areas that we discussed and, and then opening up on, on some other areas, really. We, we've set some, some discussion points, but we don't have to stick to those precisely. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some opening comments from all of our speakers uh, relevant to those. And then we'll have some questions and some crosstalk, and then we'll, we'll get into the Q&A side. So, Megan, um, over to you to start with. Textile Exchange really sits astride the industry, doing some really groundbreaking work at the moment. It must be quite hard for you to keep up with everything that's going on in your own organization, mm -hmm. let alone in the membership. So um, really looking forward to, to hearing your point of view as, as an organization that looks across all of this to see how you're kind of charting the change and, and what your thoughts are as, as to how this idea of circularity and design and materials is, is evolving quickly. So Megan, over to you for some opening comments. Perfect. Great. So yes, as you said, there's a lot to unpack here in terms of our work and just what we need to solve for as an industry as it relates to circularity and much larger topics as well. So a couple of kind of things that are really important in terms of how we view circularity through the lens of textile exchange. So to achieve the 1.5 degrees pathway, we must focus on reducing our emissions by 45% in just eight years. So no pressure, right? Um, but really circularity is embedded in textile exchanges climate plus strategy, which we released in 2019, and are therefore really cuts across three levers or strategic areas of focus in which we feel that the industry really needs to lean into at the raw material production stage. So based off of some initial modeling that we've done and conducted, that helps us kind of determine these path forwards in terms of achieving the 45% GHG reduction goal. It's become extremely evident that we simply can't rely on material substitution or the conversion of existing solutions in the marketplace. And that this alone will not get us to this goal of 45% GHG reduction. So we must also make advancements um, and really solve for three critical areas. So impact data gaps for both innovative and existing materials, scaling proven, and I wanna emphasize the proven portion here. Um, so scaling proven, innovative and emerging materials as well as producing less. So really how does this all relate to circularity? So producing less inherently incorporates some of the key circular principles. So first being that keeping products in circulation at the end of their life through resale, repair, and recycling services can make str or significant strides in this area. And secondly, through really advancing and scaling closed loop production. So thinking about textile to textile recycling, as this then will lessen our dependency or the need to have to then extract natural resources from the earth to make new products. And then to kind of close this all up, this really kind of brings me back to the urgency around filling this innovation gap or really 
scaling up these innovative proven solutions as a pathway to reducing our GHG emissions by 45%. So if we think about priorities, I mean, polyester, cotton, viscose, and wool make up over 80% of our total fiber materials production. So what we need to do is if we can't simply rely on the existing materials, we need to also then once again, scale up these alternative solutions. So textile to textile recycling is a huge unlock for those materials that are dependent on oil and wood feedstocks. And then incorporating regenerative principles and practices into the growing of fibers from soil systems is also really critical. And my last point on that is to note that most people don't see regenerative ag as an innovative path forward or method and approach because indigenous communities have really been practicing these farming and grazing methods for years but we've lost our way simply put and technology can help us really unlock um, a lot of the potential at assessing biodiversity soil health and the use of our water and land to take a systems approach thanks megan yeah it really is a case of all the tools in the toolbox isn't it being used out there at the moment david let, let me turn to you i mean this this is a fast moving area i even feel looking at the news that lots happened since april when we held our, our last event on this what, what what are your latest thoughts on 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 the subject and how things are, are moving forward and in particular if you'd like to talk about you know how the internal conversations going around the the design side uh, over to you david sure happy to um I think it's amazing to um, realize how far circularity has come in the last couple of years. And I recall many years back, you know, when um, the first couple of reports were launched around circularity and the industry was trying to get an understanding of what it could be. I think we have, we have come a long way. Um, still, when you um, look at circularity, it's like it's like a homemade smoothie, right? You, you know the name, you roughly know the ingredients. But every time you make it, it tastes slightly different. So depending on the graph you look at, depending on the article you read, there are so many different lenses um, to circularity and certainly also depending on the business that you're in. So the question we ask in BF is, is rather, how can we design our value chain in a way that circular principles are incorporated, but really in a way of how we envision the VF value chain to look like as we go forward. And next to a circularity, which is sort of that big circle, there are so many teeny tiny circles. If you dive into the value chain and look at the various improvement opportunities you have. So let me give you a couple of examples here and also share how we how we do things in VF. So a baseline example that might sound very basic is you know what happens to leftover fabrics to to scraps in the production. Um, so there's lots of work going on internally simply to map the upstream supply chain, which is quite difficult if you work with hundreds and literally thousands of suppliers up to you know, tier four, tier five at times. So it's very tedious work really mapping um, the capabilities of suppliers upstream for recycling. And But it's needed in order to close to close that circle next to, to other initiatives there as well. Um, another example, of course, you know, we have to keep products that are being produced in use for as long as possible. So the North Face um, Renewed and Timberland Loop are two programs that offer the capability for consumers to return products, which are then being refurbished, put up for resale, um, or are being created into something entirely new. It also is a platform for us to, to move our damaged products to um, for those to be disassembled and dismantled. Um, another example to close that loop. Uh, we heard about carbon just before. Um, there's a carbon cycle that is broken. There are water cycles we need to look into. There is way too much carbon in the air. There is way too little carbon in the soil. Water doesn't cycle anymore. So we just heard about one opportunity to contribute to reestablish um, those cycles, which is regenerative agriculture. So in VF, we are building supply chains around cotton, rubber, leather, the source, those crucial materials from farms that practice holistic land management, plant grazing, and regenerative principles. And it's amazing when you stand on a piece of land 
and you see either how broken it is or you see what it has become once it's been under a regenerative practice um, management for, for a few months or years really only um, that it takes to bring back biodiversity and, and enrich the soils. Another example, um, energy efficiency. So next to, of course, um, having a most efficient machinery, it's um, um, just a few days ago, VF has completed um, a 70 million USD investment, tax equity investments to fund four solar units in the US, which in sum will generate around one fifth of the global VF electricity load. Um, that's massive and it will bring us a huge step ahead in, in, in meeting our goals in that specific domain. And of course, designing for a purpose, we have heard that in the beginning. So Timberlands has launched um, a piece of footwear, the Timberland Tracker, which is explicitly designed for disassembly and end of life. What does it mean? It means that a piece of footwear can be taken apart very easily. And you only start to understand what it means once you have looked at conventional footwear and the effort and the force it takes to disassemble a conventional piece of footwear and the dirt that you have in the various material streams that result out of that. So any of the examples I've just given you um, looked at in isolation are really only incremental. But when you take all of those lenses together and you combine it, you will start to understand what circularity will be as we move forward. Thank you. I mean, a lot of your products are hard wearing, kind of out, outdoorsy kind of gear. It's, it's, it's not cheap. It's got a good ethos with it. You haven't quite got the Patagonia halo, uh, but then who does, right? Um, We're working on it. You're working on it. Well, you know what you need to do now, don't you? If you want to keep up with that. <laughs> um, but, but on that point of um, materials as a resource, is that and where's that internal conversation about how your designers and your team value that? I, I imagine that's a kind of done deal now, um, particularly with expensive materials. Um, but with customers, where's the conversation internally about getting them to see what they buy from you as a resource that needs to be reused? Because that is a really fundamental change that a brand like yours is very well positioned to drive on in, in circularity. Absolutely. Um, so materials, as we have. Um but before is the crucial unlock to lower um, GHG emissions across the industry. So for VF, um, anything from raw material extraction to the finished product accounts for roughly 75% of VF's total um, emissions. So it's crucial to focus on that particular piece. There also is a target we have internally to convert our top nine materials, which really is 95 plus minus percent of all the materials we use by volume to convert those into being sourced from renewable, um, responsible sourced or regenerative sources. So um, that definitely is you know, the, the key target that we have um, to meet as we move forward. I think with regards to customers, um, a brand like ours, of course, um, needs to stand there and first of all, voice the demand and also provides confidence into the sourcing marketplace that those materials will be crucial as we move ahead. Um, when I take the example of regenerative agriculture, for instance, all of that is in its infancy at this point in time. So just a few weeks back, I've been to Portugal to um, visit some farms. And in the US, we would visit farms or Thailand. And um, it's invaluable to have a conversation with farmers to reassure them that this is a direction that is vital um, for, for brands um, under, under the VF um, Corporation umbrella. Thank you. Yes, it's always amazing when you visit farms and you look at land rehabilitation and land change, how easily, how, how it can be enabled by us simply in many ways just getting out of the way uh, and then enabling the right kind of change. And I think those are the stories that can really inspire the industry, whether that's um, recycling impacts, saving carbon emissions, which then affect nature, or whether it's natural fibers. Sarah, let me turn to you for a minute. Um, H&M, um, obviously, I imagine when circularity first came up, um, 
you know, as if you didn't have enough to deal with with being a, a fast fashion brand with all the labour standard stuff that fast fa fashion brands have been associated with. Circularity must have been quite a challenging conversation with regard to the business model. I imagine you still hear a lot of that now. You know, how can you do that? You're a fast fashion brand. But H&M, like many other companies, has been through a real transformation, I think, in, in at least in thinking um, and in many, many of areas of your work in the last few years. Tell us a bit about the, 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 key, the highlights of that uh, with regard to this topic and, and how you're getting that message across and, and showing that circularity is actually part of the, the fast fashion business model. Or is, that, or is that a term I shouldn't use anymore? Tell me. <laughs> Good question. But I mean, I think you have said it. I mean, we, uh, we have really been on a journey here uh, for a number of years uh, and really trying to understand what does moving towards the circular economy mean for H&M Group. And our, and our understanding of that has definitely evolved and developed when we were first uh, working with our circular economy strategy. And I mean, initially when we were yeah, setting the strategy back then and trying to understand, you know, what would the circular approach mean throughout our entire uh, value chain, we were really looking into, you know, each area. Okay, what is it really going to mean for design for materials? What is it going to mean for our production process, processes, our customer, and really close the loop as well. But I think we've actually been on quite a journey the last number of years in really understanding that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Actually, all of those areas are so interconnected. And I mean, I think we've heard a bit on that from some of the speakers already. So, I mean, if you're really focusing into one area, like it, it connects immediately with some of those other areas. And this is also something that there is such an increasing sense of urgency around. Like it's becoming more and more clear that if we are gonna reach our climate goals, our biodiversity goals, you know, it's not gonna be enough to only work with renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, and so on. Like we really need to change how we are actually making and using products. Like that is going to be a crucial part if we're gonna reach that. So in order to really accelerate momentum, uh, we need to be building on those interesting activities actually. So we've been doing quite a bit of work to really evolve our approach and our strategy more towards uh, a circular ecosystem. And again, really looking at how do we embed principles of a circular economy throughout each area, uh, but really trying to tap into those interconnectivities so that we can accelerate progress here. Because I mean, it really does start at the drawing board. And for me, that is just so exciting because my main area is working with circular design. But how can we really design a product from day one that is going to circulate throughout that system, but also making sure that we are looking at having the infrastructure in place, working together with suppliers, like we've worked so much on establishing a really efficient linear supply chain. But now how do we really build up that supply chain to bring everything back? Because I mean, now we're moving towards a situation where like our supply chain, that's going to include customers' wardrobes, like the resources are out there. So how would we really have uh, that system to keep those resources in circulation? which then can also give access to a more circular customer journey. Like I think the, how we experience uh, fashion is gonna need to evolve. It's not gonna be only about buying new products. We're gonna look, need to look at alternative access models. Uh, what is new, to, you know, new to you might not necessarily be new. Like how do we really look at creating news value and creating that fashion experience for our customers, but using resources, uh, yeah, using resources in a more circular way. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it has really been quite a journey and uh, we uh, learn an every day on that. Uh, and I think that's, that's what makes it so exciting right now, yeah. Can you give us any examples of how things are accelerating? I mean, I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that we at Innovation Forum think we've really seen a huge acceleration, not just in interest, but in actual numbers. I'm seeing, you know, numbers with a zero or two added on them in terms of, you know, take back and recycling and upcycling and so on of, of garments. Well, mm -hmm. wh wh where are you on, on, on that in terms of, you know, progress in recent times? Can you give us a sense of the pace of change? Because clearly yeah. that, that element of getting stuff back is, is absolutely vital. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of several examples there. I mean, we have been working progressively uh, with our material goals the last number of years. Like we have 
uh, we have a goal to have 100% sustainably sourced materials by 30 but the, I mean, the momentum on that has been totally ramping up. Uh, we were seeing initially uh, increases, but I mean, it takes time, but now the rate of change is really accelerating. Like last year, yeah, in, yeah, for 2021, we uh, increased up to 80% uh, more sustainably sourced materials from the year before being at 65%. So it's quite a big jump. And also looking at our use of recycled materials. Uh, we set a goal around recycled materials, looking at having 30% recycled materials 2025. And I mean, in the initial years when we were looking at, at that, like really small percentages, uh, but you have to start somewhere. And then it grows and the numbers started tripling. Uh, and I think last year it was at, I think 17.9%. So, I mean, you have to start somewhere and then build on, and then you have to constantly be raising the bar because you know we have that goal for recycled materials, but how do we ahead look at you know further stimulating uh, post-consumer recycled content, content and really looking at scaling up textile to textile solutions? So it's really about understanding, you know, it's a complex journey and you don't go from it said you need to take those steps on that journey to get there and I mean just on the circular business model side as well on the more customer facing uh, piece I mean we we know that that's going to be a crucial part of uh, solutions ahead or it's going to be a crucial solution ahead um, but we have spent a lot of time really trying to understand you know what are these models where are our customers at what kind of impact can they bring? Like, how do we, how do we need to work with uh, developing our systems and our infrastructure to support them? And I mean, now we're in a phase where we need to look at how do we capture all those learnings across brands of the services within our group, and actually look at okay, how do we start scaling now? And I mean, we we still learning. Like, it's still a bumpy journey, but um, we we need to be continuing to make progress here. So I mean, going from you know, initial pilots where, um, you know, looking at having resale in a small number of stores. And now we have, um, now we have secondhand products on H&M.com. Uh, so that's been quite a big step for us. Like now it's in Sweden and Germany, but looking at how do we take that broader and how do we, you know, provide that to customers to be able to have that choice uh, that they can see those products beside each other. Um, Yes, and more to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, well, it, it always gives me hope to remember that your CEO used to be your head of sustainability, uh, which is still very rare in business. Uh, and I know also, of course, as a as a brand that's always in the in the headlines or in the in the crosshairs, depending on the, uh, what's coming out, uh, that that definitely keeps you on your toes. And there's a lot more to come on on all of this, particularly, I guess, with um, the incentives and. Extended producer responsibility schemes we're, we're starting to see discussed across the EU and elsewhere. So we'll come back to much of that, uh, I imagine, in the Q&A. Lucy, over to you. Um, I'm lucky enough to, to have been in senior facilities, uh, and I'm actually going again next month, which I'm hugely looking forward to. But for those who don't really understand what, what Asia Pacific Rayon does, uh, just tell us about what a circular viscose solution can look like. And then I'd love to hear your comments about how that fits into some of the issues that we've been hearing about from, from Megan, Sarah and David. Lucy. Sure. Um, thanks, Sobi. I hope you guys can hear me well. So um, I think the point that's coming out right now really is that true circularity is really beyond recycling. This is, it's not just about thinking how the final product can re-enter these, uh, re enter back into the supply chain, but actually really looking at the whole holistic process of the, the value chain and trying to see you know, how can we embed circularity at every phase of the, the production process? So I, yeah, I, can, I can give examples about how Asia Pacific Rayon is integrating sustainability and circularity, especially with its integration with our company, the April Group. But I think the first point that I'd like to make is that um, really circularity starts first and foremost with the right material choice. Um, there was a report that was produced by Forum for the Future, and I think most of us would be familiar with that organization. They came up with some guidance on how the fashion industry can adopt a circular economy approach. And 
basically one of the key actions that they identified for us is that we need to accelerate the shift to renewable inputs. And this includes shifting to more bio-based fibers, such as cellulosic materials, which also includes uh, viscose. Um, many of the speakers on the call today would be familiar that um, around 60% of global material use is still synthetic fibers. So it's about 65 million tons of, of fiber on a yearly basis. Now, what this accounts for, according to some reports, is that it, it generally, well, it's generates about 43% of the greenhouse gas emissions of the fashion industry. Now, cellulosic fibers, on the other hand, including viscose, only accounts for about 6% of the global material basket. So there is a wide latitude for a transition to a renewable material in the industry right now with all the choices that are available within the cellulosic uh, material basket. But beyond just material choice, it is really about in embedding circularity, as I mentioned, at every phase of the product life cycle, where waste is first and foremost avoided and reduced. And of course, anything that's left is reused and, and recycled. And what this basically means is implementing really, or going back to the basics of the three R's, you know, in, in the production process of uh, reducing, reusing, and recycling. So it's not really just about saying, so once it's produced, how do you then bring it back, right? But it's really looking at the entire chain and trying to see how do we integrate this? So in our case, for example, we look at this across energy, water, chemicals, and fiber. Uh, the viscose mills, including Asia Pacific Ray and for example, APR can already recover chemicals by, up to, uh, by as much as 98%. And we do not buy our electricity, we generate our own electricity. And 90% of our energy requirement comes from the biomass that is a byproduct of the production cycle. And then at the same time, just recently, we have managed to already reduce our waste to landfill by as much as 50% because our solid wastes are now used as, as fertilizers for the tree plantations and also as material for the construction of the roads within the complex and also for the local communities. So these are just some of the examples as to how we're able to reduce many of the materials and including the byproducts of the production process, you know, in, in some other ways that they create value on their own. Um, and at the same time, they impact our own goals in terms of climate emissions as well. Now, there is also the point about textile recycling, which is uh, still a big part of this. And I guess what really needs to happen is that we need to accelerate the rate of the use of recycled material into, into the production process. It is really a sad rate of what, of just about 1% of the 100 million tons of textiles that's produced annually. So what this entails is of course, increased investments in infrastructure for sorting and or for collecting and sorting of recycled textiles. And we have been conducting surveys on the availability of feedstocks in the markets that are close to us, Indonesia, China, Malaysia, and even Sri Lanka and Bangladesh to try and understand how much feedstock availability and what is the extent of the infrastructure and the investment that will be required for us to be able to set up this, this process in the market. We have just recently partnered also with the National, uh, the Nanyang Technological Institute of, of Singapore on what is called the Sustainable Textile Recycling, uh, Sustainable Textile Research. And basically we're looking at the, the option of urban recycling. There are so many hotels that throw away their towels and their sheets on a yearly basis. And these are all cotton that can be reused for viscose production as well. So that is also being closely looked into. Now, to be honest, there is a technological capability to have if a, to have viscose with 50% recycled material in the market right now. I mentioned earlier that we are the, vis the biggest viscose producer as a group. And basically we have the business interest and the capability to scale up the commercial availability of viscose with very high recycled content. But we are looking to the brands to give us the right signal to actually signal that they are willing to take or to, to have a significant market uptake for such a product. And currently we are not yet seeing that incentive. So that is really something that can be, I, I think that can be discussed because for this to happen, for this type of scale up to happen, it needs to have a, a collaboration across the value chain. I think Stella McCartney just announced right now a line called uh, made to be remade 
and basically to be able to come up with a product, which is basically just saying you scan a barcode and you can return the product and they will recycle it, is they needed a consortium. And there were three or four or five other companies that were involved in that kind of a partnership. That is the kind of collaboration that needs to happen for products like this to come out of pilot and actually be commercially scaled up. Now, finally, I think everyone has mentioned this, right? Um, circularity is really about us critically looking into what the fast fashion business model is resulting in, in terms of wastes and resource inefficiencies. Um, I think really what's causing the waste is basically just unmitigated production and consumption. So the brands need to take the lead in terms of encouraging more responsible consumption and more responsible choices among the consumers being on the front end of these, right? But at the same time, of course, uh, the fashion industry is very much compliance driven. So once the brand set that signal, then the rest of the manufacturing supply chain could only will, will only you know would only need to comply with that. So um, I've heard of examples of how H and M and David also mentioned about how we're starting to invest in programs of repair schemes and resale platforms and such. So those are good incentives, and brands I think need to encourage more of those. So if I can just summarize, I think basically from our perspective, from the upstream end, we really believe it starts from the, making the right material choices, embedding it in every, you know, in every step of the entire production cycle, meaning integrating really the upstream into all these conversations about circularity, because we there's a big part of that process that's actually coming from what they consider the opaque upstream or, or middle part of the, of the value chain, right? And then, of course, scaling up and incentivizing the use of recycled content in, in material production, uh, particularly in viscose. And, of course, encouraging responsible consum consumption. So I'll stop there, Toby, for now. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Lucy, two quick questions, and maybe Megan can reflect on the second, and Sarah and David as well. The first question is, do you see a time then where, where APR April could become a, a regional recycler of, of viscose? Uh, that sounds like a really interesting proposition. You know, we always talk about brands taking the lead, but actually, you know, you're the ones in the region. You've got the some of the infrastructure. Do you see that happening in, in the coming years? Yes, we do. And we are actually actively pursuing it. It is something that we are discussing with a lot of partners on and looking at how we can still integrate the informal market, even if we are going to set up a formal collection and sorting facility for the use of recycled textile here in Indonesia, because there's, there, there will be an impact in terms of informal community because there are other ways that the, that the recycled textile are being used right now, but not necessarily in a, val, in a high value add way as we would be able to do it. But yes, I guess we're looking at in the next three to five years where we will be able to really push this forward. But uh, as I said, we need to we we need to have that collaboration. We are producing already a, a product, a, a commercial product with 40, 20 percent recycled content right now, but we are only able to see how this is going to perform up to the yarn uh, level, and then at the same time, of course, uh, with some other with a few brand collaborators in China. But beyond that, we do not know because the significant uptake from the brands still needs to happen on this. Yeah, well, that leads me neatly into my second question, which was that missing incentive that you mentioned. Um, tell us, frankly, why is that incentive missing that you mentioned? Is it just about price? Is it about lack of understanding of the material choice and its ramifications? Really interested to hear what you think. And then, Megan, perhaps you might have a comment, and, and David and Sarah as well. Lucy. Sure. Uh, to be perfectly candid, it's because there are certain um, ranking sourcing frameworks that are being used in the industry that label um, our, our products or our mills as controversial sources of, 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 of viscose. And, and that also extends to some other products that did not even use viscose from our mills, right? Because, for example, the, the recycled product that's being sold by Saturday is actually using um, uh, recycled dis dissolving pulp from Sodra. And, but, the, but you know, well, however we're being rated right now as a controversial source is also affecting the, the interest of the brands to work with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Megan, much food for thought for you in the last half an hour or so. Any comment on, on that last point or any of the others you've heard in the last 30 minutes? 
All really great points and a ton of comments. And I wish I could answer some of the questions, but I know that we're limited on time. So just a few things to kind of quickly comment on. So I agree that there's a huge issue in terms of uh, incentivizing these new emerging materials to scale at a quicker rate um, than they are currently. And I think there are a couple of unlocks. One is really thoughtful investment. And I think one way to help kind of steer that investment and that's broadening the investment community and inviting them to the table. Um, but one way to help kind of steer that community is through creating some sort of, not just a tool, but a process and methodology in which we can evaluate these new emerging materials to make sure that they're in fact aligning with our Climate Plus strategy, improving soil health, um, supporting us on our GHG reduction pathway, water, et cetera, capturing all of those key critical indicators. Um, and then really quickly, I know that we're running out of time. There are some great questions in the Q&A, and I just want to point people to a couple of resources um, at Textile Exchange, one of which is the Regenerative Landscaping Analysis Report that can be found on our website. A ton of great information there that covers the key principles of regenerative ag. And then another is just to invite people to our round tables. There was a ton of questions around polyester synthetics and recycling and fossil fuel and how it all fits together. Um, I invite everyone to join our roundtables because we're doing some really great work and thinking around that concept. Great, thank you. We will go into some of the questions. I know there are some great ones. You've touched on them there. But David, uh, you've been listening very intently. Uh, what would you like to add at this point? Yeah, maybe through um, the last question you asked on the, the incentivization of new materials. So there, there are a couple of dimensions to look at. So from a business perspective, specifically over the past couple of months, we have realized that availability and on-time availability and cost is not a given. So um, if I take more or less innovative material like organic cotton, um, you know, it's availability, it's price, it's through the roof. So for businesses, it's very difficult to scale. And Megan, you probably know um, the overall availability of the cotton mix when it comes to organic. I'm not sure if we are still at around 1% or if that has much or less um, increased over the past couple of months. Um, so availability at scale is, is critical. Um, I would say for recycled materials, oftentimes you run into the disadvantage of recycled materials um, carrying the cost of innovation. If you will. So the playing field is not always even compared to conventional materials. Um, I think this is something that you know needs to be addressed and somehow resolved. And we see you no know, great um, regulatory work streams in that and that um, targeting this like EPR extended producer responsibility that will incentivize the uptake of uh, more sustainable materials. Um, so I think um, again from a business perspective, um, cost availability. Um, level playing field overall, I think, is is critical and also performance. Um, of course, I mean it's a vast difference if you work in like lifestyle um, textiles if you design for performance, and consumers literally um, entrust their lives when they climb the Himalayas um, in your product, and it just needs to perform. Period. Thank you, uh, Sarah. It seems only fair to offer you. A space to comment briefly before we get into some of the q a so anything you'd like to add yeah thanks toby i mean i think i can definitely amplify um amplify some of the comments already mentioned um and i think on the the question posed to all of us i mean it's a really a big discussion at the minute going on now around um yeah cellulosic overall and i mean for us uh cotton is uh over 60 percent of our material basket so really is a lot of discussion now to see, you know, okay, where ahead next? I mean, we had the 2020 um, more sustainably sourced cotton goals. So now again, we need to see where do we raise the bar? Uh, and there is a lot of questions as well around, you know, future resource security. How do we make sure that we keep existing resources in the loop, but also what can alternatives be? <laughs> um, so I think, Definitely, uh, there needs to be ongoing discussions around that. And I mean, a lot of the unlocks have already been mentioned, but I think definitely that piece around um, EPR and a harmonized approach there, that is really going to be key, as well as how are we defining uh, resources and waste. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, to be able to come around uh, the challenges today, even with you know transporting resources to different locations, and that all adds a lot of cost as well. Um, yes, and then I would say, of course, connected back to design and a bit what you mentioned as well, David, like. For our design teams, uh, they are also working a lot with design for product purpose in our circular design program, Circulator. So that is really going to be crucial to consider ahead because it's many different areas that we look at now, uh, looking at now in circular design, like environmental impact, durability, recyclability, how do you design to eliminate waste, increase use, all of that. But how do you balance? those trade-offs in that, that exist between some of those areas in connection to how the product is going to be used because products are used differently. And it's also about how do we optimize resource use uh, when, yeah, we, we do have these challenges around resources yeah. today. Yeah. Definitely, and I think to, to some extent, we are in a situation where um, brands design for a future that does not yet exist. So we design for disassembly, we design for um, circular recycling, technologies we design for um, repair you know, the infrastructure to um, to execute against all of this at scale it's still at its, in its infancy um, so it will be very exciting to see how you know one of the next milestones will influence um, what we just discussed now and as of 25 I think all EU member states will need to have mandatory textile collection schemes in place. This will 10x, 20x um, the volume of textile waste we'll have in the European Union. And with that supply, there comes an innovation and technology to solve that problem. So the problem we know that's there, somehow it's not, it's not tangible at this point in time because of those missing um, recycling streams at scale. So it will be interesting, very interesting to see how the future will play out and how those design um, philosophies that you, Sarah, have nicely described uh, will, will support um, the, the future state. Thank you. Yeah, David, your, your comment reminded me of a very frank discussion we had at one of our conferences a couple of years ago where one of the speakers, I won't say the brand, said, you know, everyone's telling us to take spandex out of our clothes. Um, you know, the, we didn't used to use so much of it. Now there's a lot more being used. And he said, to be totally honest, we're not taking it out. It's not going to happen. Uh, people like it. People buy it. We're a business. We've got to find a way to have these mixed fibers be sustainable. So my question to you all, um, which is slightly unfair, but it's moderator's privilege to ask you difficult questions. Will chemical recycling be regarded as circular or is it already? Because it, really, it seems like that's one of the principal solutions. We don't like to talk about it. Lots of NGOs hate it. Uh, and we can and I can understand why just to a certain degree. But being realistic, it does seem like a, a very significant part of the solution, although an unfortunate one. So is it a circular solution in your view? And I'd be interested to know what the other panelists think. You can be fairly brief in your responses, if you like. Maybe I, I break the ice and I start. Um, I'm not sure whether, um, whether putting circular ahead of materials, like circular materials or circular design technologies or circular and whatnot, whether that does as a favor as an industry um, to you know to label uh, materials or technologies like that, I think um, chemical recycling definitely is a path to pursue forward next to many other paths. Where does it stand at the moment? Of course, we are still learning. I mean, a couple of years ago, it was unthinkable for mixed waste streams to depolymerize to create new products um, out of out of out of that. We are getting there, which is great. Is it up to where it's supposed to be from its um, footprint, from you know, um, overall sustainability LCA um, type of um, lenses? Probably, probably not. But we still need to get through that phase of inefficiency to get towards efficiency. So innovation from its from its onset is, is never efficient. And so we need to explore, and that definitely is a path something that's worthwhile exploring. That's a very diplomatic and nuanced answer. Thank you, David. Megan, you're not allowed to simply agree with David. <laughs> what are your thoughts? 
No, I, I think kind of building upon that and further exploring, I think there's a couple of things that as an industry, we all need to come to terms with and start to do a further and deeper dive is noting that there are multiple kind of forms of chemical recycling. There's not just one application. And I think the confusion around the industry is that we typically speak to it in terms of one form of processy. There's multiple feedstocks and different types of production. So I think I just wanted to kind of clear the air with that. And I do think that there is a path forward for chemical recycling. As I just said earlier in my presentation or kind of opening remarks, we have to solve for textile to textile recycling in order to see the in order to achieve the 45% GHG reduction goal. There's no way around it. And that is one solution, but we need to identify the best forms and processes of chemical recycling opportunities to be able to drive this work forward. And as I said earlier as well, make sure that those impacts are beneficial and that they're aligned with our climate plus goals as an industry in supporting us and driving advancements in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, an excellent nuance build on top of that. Sarah, um, uh, mm. very interested to hear what you think. And, and then Lucy, you can be fairly brief if you want. A lot, a lot of detail and nuance has been added to that. And thank you, by the way, Megan, for the clarification on types of chemical recycling. I think that's not as widely known outside the, the immediate industry as it could be. So thank you for that. Sarah, brief comment. Yeah, I mean, uh, Megan spot on, like we love to put labels on things, but actually there's a lot of nuance here. Um, I don't want to repeat any of the great points already made too much in detail, but I think what I could add also is, um, you know, in relation to what I was mentioning earlier in this need to design for product purpose and also understanding some of the trade-offs that can exist today. And this is really why we need a multitude of approaches and solutions. And I mean, one of the most common trade-offs that we see when we are looking into circular design with our teams is really you know, how do we balance, uh, you know, the need for more durable products, but also the need to be able to recycle them, because sometimes, you know, there is quite an interplay there. And I mean, when we're looking at some of the chemical uh, recycling solutions there, we can see that, okay, the quality output is maybe not as effective if we maybe looked at mechanical recycling, where actually the fiber is being broken down. Um, and so the quality is uh, reduced somewhat. And then uh, you, you perhaps need to mix it in with other qualities to be able to reach that durability threshold. Uh, so I think, again, understanding those nuances and trade-offs a little bit will be a key ahead to really be able to see, you know, what solutions out of, out of a wide box are we going to go away here. Thank you. Lucy, I imagine you have views on this. I, remember, I think three years ago when I went to your viscose plant, you were on about 96% recycling in the plant and then you just mentioned 98 percent so you're you're clearly heading up there towards the, the magic number uh what are your thoughts on this this last part before we get into the more of the q a sure uh, i don't think it, i think it's too early to rule out any solution at this point we will really be looking into different options and trying to see i i do understand that there are certain losses between mechanical and and chemical recycling but at the same time um, given the available choices right now, we should be able to pursue both options and see exactly uh, until we get to the point where, some, where more mature solutions are available and therefore we can then really make some hard and fast choices or really assess some of the trade-offs between, what is, you know, between the, the two options of mechanical and chemical, harvest, uh, chemical uh, recycling. Great. Well, thank you. There are loads of great questions here. We've covered some areas of them. Some of them are a little bit niche. Uh, on off topic, but um, let's we've only got about five minutes left. I think there's a brilliant question by Brandon Burke, which is pretty popular. Um, and this is perhaps one for all of you. Uh, what are some of the lessons learned from mistakes in developing circularity strategy? Um, and you're not allowed to do that cliched interview question answer of, you know, I'm too much of a perfectionist. That's my biggest flaw. Or, you know, I, I want some I want some real stories here. Uh, you've all been through the mill, no pun intended. Uh, in sustainability in the last five or ten years or longer. So lessons learned from mistakes made. Who wants to go first? I can kick us off here. I think kind of in hindsight of where the industry has come and just even in my career, we really cannot look at these things in silo. Um, I think a lot of us have addressed the key principle, key principles of circularity as well as an even thinking 
thinking about regenerative ag, we must make sure that we're moving forward on all of those principles and that all of those principles are embedded into the systems that we're building. I think if we focus on one particular area and leave everything else to the side, we're missing the bigger picture and the bigger impact that can be made. And I think that is important for myself, our organization, brands, regulators, everyone within this industry. I would maybe add um, from a brand perspective, um, you have to do circularity without calling it circularity. So circularity is not a term that the business uses, right? It's, um, it's a philosophy, if you will, that stands next to how a business operates. Um, what I've seen throughout my career, you know, there were fun conversations around um, bringing in sort of dedicated general managers or senior managers that would have the title um, of circularity within their, within their job description. I think what that easily leads to is that circularity is look, being looked at something that we also need to do. You know, there are like five priorities and this is the sixth or the first or whatever, but it's one out of a few. Um, I think circularity is way more a philosophy that speaks to how businesses are to operate going forward. So I would say understand um, the language that is being spoken in the business, understand the priorities, and link in those micro cycles, um, circular thinking into, into how you operate as a, as a business. I think this is, this is critical to um, help people to get on, that, on the way. All the circles are great, but trust me, they, you show a circle and people get off topics, they don't get it easily in a business. It's not, it's not intuitive, as I said before. Thank you. Uh, Lucy, uh, what, what have you learned? I mean, you've been trying to build the actual supply chain on the ground. You, you must have got some stuff wrong. <laughs> what, what have you learned? What are some of the critical lessons you think in, in doing this? And if you have any response to, to David's perspective, uh, you're very welcome. Lucy. Sure. Thank you, Toby. Um, a lot of them, as you say, are very practical in terms of really what works, what, what percentage, what blending, what technologies need to happen, and what other sources apart from textile wastes. What about agricultural waste and some other sources of fiber that can also be incorporated into this? So there have been a lot of, uh, I guess, trials and, and yes, as you can say errors or lessons that have been learned along the way, but I think uh, the, the, the one big thing that we're realizing here is that while recycling is a big part of it, it's not just really what circularity is all about. David has already mentioned that this is a whole philosophy. It's your approach to the business and to try to see how really, how best you can achieve resource efficiency. And at the same time, looking at the impacts of this beyond just you, you know, the efficiency of the, res the resources, but really looking at how it's gonna affect your, your emissions reduction targets, your impact on biodiversity, your impact on the community. So it's much more, it's, it's a much more holistic approach is I, I guess why we always say that we need to be working across the, the whole value chain in, in terms of really adopting a circular economy approach for the fashion industry. And I think that's a distinction that needs to be made. Thank you. Sarah, almost out of time. Let me give the final word to you. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I was actually hitting up a bit on what you were saying as an introduction to this question. I mean, uh, we don't have like we don't have time to be perfect. Uh, there is just this real sense of urgency. Um, and I mean, we need to be able to learn and adapt and we need to be able to be humble about that. Like we can't wait until we get right. There's just no time. Um, so that is something I'm seeing more and more from high level, even right down to neighbor details, like even within the circular design work that we do and now, uh, even like down to the smallest details. We are learning all the time and it is so rapid that you need to be able to say, okay, yeah, that didn't work. I have to try something else like disassemblable trims. Can we actually manually sort them at scale? You know, who knows? So we need to be able to, yeah, learn and adapt at a rapid pace and, and then not be afraid of that and not be afraid of those big questions. I mean, if we looking at decoupling resource use from revenue, I mean, that's really big questions. We need to be able to have that space to not be afraid and um, be a bit humble about it as well, yeah? 
thank you. And I think what I've noticed this increasingly there's so many more inspiring examples out there. It's not just on on the brand. You have a responsibility and you know textile exchange and then your supply options like April are working hard to give you the product. But there's so many other players in the space doing interesting work. I think of Bank and Vogue in North America. I think of Usha Yarns in India. You go and look at some of the numbers, the scale they're starting to operate at now in terms of solutions here along with those present. It, it really starts to show us there is a way forward. And to your, to your point, Sarah, we don't have time to be perfect. So we're doing the best we can. Um, thank you all. This has been fascinating. You've been fascinating. Thank you for the great questions, audience. Uh, this will be edited and put out as an audio podcast uh, on your podcast app. Uh, it's available on all the best ones and the bad ones. So uh, you can listen to it again. Sign up. If you're not signed up for our updates, you'll get more of this soon. And we have a couple of conferences coming up. Our Sustainable Landscapes and Commodities Conference is November 1st and 2nd uh, in Amsterdam. And just before that, on the 11th and 12th of October, we have our Plastics and Packaging Conference, uh, which should be of interest to, to many of you. Those are physical events taking place in Amsterdam. So mid-October for Plastics and Packaging, um, and 1st, 2nd November for Landscapes and Sustainable Commodities, which forestry and viscose and other areas, of course, are, are key subjects on the agenda. So hopefully you can join us at one of those. If not, keep listening. We'll be back soon. Love to get your feedback. Uh, we'll let you all get back uh, to work. And panel, thank you all so much for your time. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Big thanks. Thank you.